Hi, my name is Daniel Joseph Gomez Santos, and this is HTLV1 from neurosurgery to neuroimaging and biomarkers of neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration in HAM TSP progression. Before we start looking at the world map of, of the cell prevalence of HTLV1, you can see the countries in red are above 5%, such as Japan, the Caribbean, parts of South America, parts of Africa, as well as Australia. And then between one to 5% in North America, South America, parts of Africa, and um, the Middle East and India. And then we don't have any data for parts of Asia, parts of Africa, as well as Greenland and Iceland. And then looking at the proteins of HTLV1, just to remind you, you have the GP46, the GP21, uh, which are envelope transmembrane and surface glycoproteins, uh, P19, which is the matrix layer, uh, P24, which is a capsid, P15, which is a nucleocapsid, a protease, P14, and a reverse transcriptase, P95. There's also an integrase as well as tax and rex. And then there's also a P12, P13, P30, and the B zip factor. So the P um, numbers are essentially the accessory proteins. And then getting to look at the uh, sort of the guidelines and diagnosis and lab features in human T cell leukemia virus associated myelopathy and tropical spastic paralysis or HAM TSP. Um, the age and the sex um, can be familial. So adult females predominate and it's rare that it occurs in childhood. And the onset is usually insidious. So it's slow, but again, harmful. And then some of the main neurological manifestations are the chronic spastic paralysis, which again, progresses slowly, but remains static after initial progression. You can also have weakness of lower, weakness of lower limbs and bladder disturbance usually is an early feature. Um, you can have urinary um, hesitation, constipation, which usually occurs later, and then decreased libido are also common. There's also sensory symptoms um, that are more predominant in the objective physical signs. Also, th there's lower lumbar pain uh, with radiation to the legs um, that's, uh, that is common. There's vib a vibration sense um, that's frequently impaired. And then some of the least frequent neurological findings are cerebellar signs, optic atrophy, deafness, uh, other cranial nerve deficits, a hand tremor, uh, depressed ankle jerk. And some of the lab criteria are looking for the presence of HTLV-1 antibodies or antigens in the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid or the CSF. So the CSF may slow, uh, may show mild lymphocytic uh, pleocytosis, as well as lobulated lymphocytes that may present in the blood or the CSF or both. And there can be a moderate or mild, a mild to moderate increase of protein that may be present in the CSF. So viral isolation from blood and or the CSF is ideal when possible. Some of the laboratory features in uh, HTLV associated myelopathy or HAM TSP are the flower lymphocytes, uh, hypergamma globulinemia with IgG or IgA, oligoclonal bands, uh, antibodies to GAG, ENV, uh, or and tax viral proteins, also increased CD4 positive and 4B4 uh, positive helper inducer T cells and then normal CD4 positive 2H2 or suppressor inducer T cells. There's also elevated circulated adhesion glycoprotein ICAM1, and PBMC shows a viral uh, proviral load of 254 to 3,841 uh, 3, copies um, every 10 to the fourth cells, and that's in the serum. In the CSF, you have a glucose level that's normal, uh, protein can, var uh, can variable or variability is elevated, and there's also mononuclear pleocytosis. There's also the flower lymphocytes that's in the CSF and as well as the oligoclonal bands. There's an elevated IgG synthesis rate, 
and the anti HTLV1 specific antibodies by an ELISA or a Western or and a Western blot, as well as the elevated uh, neo uh, uh level, as well as TNF alpha detected in mononuclear cells, elevated IL1 and elevated IL6, and interferon gamma. And the CSF has a uh, the CSF cell proviral load is between 1131 to 6040 copies per 10 to the fourth cells. Also, the tax antigen is present in the CSF fluid and cells and the tax gene proviral sequences in the CSF cells. Looking at the MRI of three cases of HAM TSB and HTLV1 encephalitis. Uh, starting with the brain MRI uh, showing abnormalities in this 53-year-old black man with HTLV1 myelopathy. And then here's a spinal cord MRI of a 64-year-old woman with myelopathy and HTLV1 in the CSF cells. So again, the myelopathy is the thinning of the spinal cord. And then over here, you have the HTLV1 encephalitis that's shown in four different diagrams as well as below you have the, uh, the flare image of HTLV, or sorry, ham TSB caused by HTLV1. So I just wanna uh, remind you from my last presentation or my very first presentation on the current model of CNS pathogenesis in ham TSB. So this is the viral host immunological interactions that are occurring at the blood brain barrier between the CNS and the PBMCs, you have CD4, CD4 positive T cells, HCLV1 specific CTLs or cytotoxic T cells, dendritic cells and B cells. Um, so with this blood brain barrier damage that occurs, you have translocation and transmigration of virally infected cells. So there's cytokines and chemokines, as well as antitex antibodies that are all um, present as well as the neuronal cells and there can and glial cells. So there's definitely bystander damage that occurs from the HTLV1 antigen and the HTLV1 provirus. So this is the paper that I'm going to be discussing. It's from Frontiers in Immunology in the viral immunology um, section. It's uh, following the clues. Uh, so the usefulness of biomarkers of neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration in the invest investigation of HTLV1-associated myelopathy progression. So this was published in October 2021 in volume 12, and the article number is provided. So this study was done in Brazil. Um, and you can see the uh, it's open access, edited, the edited by, reviewed by, and again, this is the specialty section, viral immunology. So the major findings in this paper of HAM TSB biomarkers in neurodegeneration and neuroinflammation were that so HAM or HAM it's axonal damage of the cortical spinal second the, the, the cortical spinal secondary to an inflammatory response against infected T cells. So they evaluated the biomarkers of neurodegeneration and neuroinflammation in HAM prognosis. Biomarkers that they used were neurofilament light or NFL, and phosphorylated NF-heavy, um, so that's PNFH chains, and then the total tau protein, as well as cellular prion protein, inflammatory cytokines, and neopterin. Or ne neopterin. They also quantified uh, the CSF and serum so samples from ham patients, and the ham patients showed high serum levels of CXCR3 binding chemokines, such as CXCL9, CXCL10, and CXCL11. And the CSF, there was elevated levels of CCL2, CCL3, CCL4, 17, 10, and CXCL11. So these CSF biomarkers um, are chemokines and they're part of the secretome or secretome. And the CCL2 binds to CCR2, and you can see the CCL2 structure on the right. So this CCL2 is a strong chemotactic response and mobilization of intracellular calcium ions. And then CCL3 binds to CCR1, 4, and 5. So it's a monokine. So it, it's a chemokine for monocytes. And that uh, 
So that occurs, the monokine, monokine, monokine occurs with inflammation and chemokinetic properties. And you can see the structure of CCL3 there. And then CXCL11 binds to CXCR3. So this is a chemotactic uh, for interleukin activated T cells, neutrophils, or monocytes. And this induces a calcium release in activated T cells. So it may play an important role in the CNS diseases, which involve T cell recruitment. Uh, getting to the CSF sample. So CSF is produced in the fourth ventricle that drains to the cisterna magna or the CM. So the CSF can also be obtained by a puncture of the cisterna magna. And the CSF is again produced by the choroid plexus in the fourth ventricle. And you can see the neuroimage image there, the fourth ventricle where the CSF um, flows through. Looking at the cerebello, cerebello medullary uh, cistern delivery of an AAV-based gene therapy in non-human primates, uh, we can access the CSF from cranial cervical junction through a posterior atlanto-occipital membrane via the cerebello medullary injection um, so this is, again, the CM injection or puncture, and it's become, uh, it started to become a procedure um, in preclinical studies. So this allows researchers to collect or inject into the CSF space with minimal invasiveness. You can see in this diagram, the cisterna magna right below the cerebellum and posterior to the medulla and the pons. So there's the atlanto Atlanto occipital membrane um, that's superior to the spine or the cervical. So this is a broader coverage of the central and the peripheral nervous system, and it offers a more reliable method for neurological gene replacement delivery, where skull mounted devices are not indicated. So this is consistent, precise, and a safe method for CSF injection with minimal equipment and technical skills. And then there's molecular biomarkers of neurological pathologies. So this is a multiplex proteomic te proteomics technology that uses modified optimers or the SOMA scan assay of CSF proteome. So this is an oligonucleotide-based proteomics approach and the data processing steps uh, to obtain the relative quantitative values for protein uh, can discriminate among the different brain conditions. So this is an attempt to search for neurological biomarkers. You can see the mouse here uh, in the prone position where there's this rhombus and the needle is going in uh, to the CSF podium. So the vast majority of the hypothesis-free proteomic studies are based on mass spectrometry and techniques are evolving now to include panels of antibodies or aptamer-based techniques. So with these aptamers, you have single-stranded oligonucleotides that are able to bind with high affinity and specificity to native folded proteins and peptides, as well as small molecules. So these are the somomers, or slow off-rate off -rate modified aptamers, and they allow for simultaneous identification of a huge set of proteins across a wide range of abundance and concentration uh, of, of abundance and con concentration by quantified protein concentration into a measurable optimer signal. So this is uh, using DNA detection technology. Uh, so typically there's a, it's a freehand lumbar puncture that's routine clinical procedure while the sub occipital region is used for post-mortem examinations. So here we have a semi-automatic uh, automated, semi-automated robotic that uses a CT or computer tomography guided needle placement for a post-mortem CSF sample, sampling. And this is called the novel vert, Vertobot. So here you can see the robotic arm um, right above the dummy there. And then in the prone position, you see the suboccipital region and then also the lumbar region um, for this semi-automatic automated robotic. There is a postmortem lumbar and suboccipital CSF sampling that's occurring here, and the postmortem computed tomography or PMCT imaging. Um, it sends the data to a custom-made vertropsy or a vertropsy control center or VCC, and the vertropsy 
planning and navigation system or station is included. So this needle trajectories are planned for both suboccipital and lumbar approaches. And the coaxial introducer needles were fully inserted automatically by a robotic system. So the PMCT was repeatedly um, or, or repeated to verify correct placement of the needles. And subsequently the CSF sample were taken using a syringe. So the puncture of the spinal canal and the cere cerebellomedullary cistern uh, could accurately be performed within a millimeter. And the failure of puncture and iotrogenic injury of the medulla oblongata may be prevented and the risk of infection is significantly reduced. So um, I'm getting bounced back from doctors that are uh, afraid to do autopsies on co-infected patients with HIV-1 and HTLV-1. So this could be a technique where the risk of infection is significantly reduced on post-mortem um, computed tomography imaging and the VCC and the uh, Vertropsy planning and navigation station. So the application allows for a minimally invasive, fast and efficient and safe CSF sampling prior to autopsy, enabling the analysis of a metabolic imbalance, infection, and more. So getting to the selection and recruitment of the study population, we have HTLV-1 infected individuals with HTLV-1 proviral load data in medical records from 2010 to 2016. So about 370 patients. Uh, medical records and individuals uh, are excluded according to the exclusion criteria, uh, people that have dropped out and followed up. So there's about 135 of those. And the first selection was 235. And then we excluded uh, low uh, proviral load um, of about 48, which brought us to the second selection of 187. So of the people that agreed, uh, asymptomatic and ham TSP patients, there was 21 for ham TSP and then asymptomatic carriers, there were 13. They did a neuro evaluation or what's called an IPEC2 disability scale. And this measured the motor, the spasticity, um, spasticity sensory and sphincter scores. So you have the gait, running, climbing stairs, jumping, um, clonus, flexor, extensor, spasms, paresthesia, lumbar pain and bladder control as well as bowel contingents. Um, and then those are scored in a total from zero to 31. So you can see the different scores you could get on the IPEC2 disability scale. And then characterizing uh, the study population, you have HTLV1 asymptomatic. Again, there's 13 of those. And then the ham TSP, there's 21. And then you have a control of nine. And you can see the age range, um, the sex and birth, uh, sex at birth, the disease duration. Uh, which is only available for the ham TSP patients are about 12.9, give or take eight years. And then IPC, IPEC2 disability scores between most of them were mild, some were moderate, and then three were severe. And then sensory and sphincter disturbances, uh, para, paresthesia, which is essentially the pins and needles tingling feeling that you get. There was about seven of those for ham TSP. Lumbar pain, we had nine. And then lower limb pain were 11, urinary disturbances, 15, and bowel continence uh, was 15. So HDLV1 proviral load in the PBMCs were highest uh, in the ham TSB patients. And in the CSF, the most glucose was in the asymptomatic carriers. And total protein, again, the asymptomatic carriers had the most for that. And then cell counts, we actually have more cell counts in the ham TSP patients. And the HTLV1 proviral load was the most in ham TSP patients as well. So looking at the neurological impairment associated with ham TSP, you have lower uh, lumbar pain, lower limb pain and lumbar pain, urinary disturbances and bowel contendence, as well as them conjoining on the paresthesia, which is the pins and needles. So you have severity of neurological disability evaluated with the IPEC2 scale, and then the correlation with the disease duration. And this was performed with a Spearman's correlation rank, and that value was R.606. And the ham TSP patients were identified 
according to the speed of the disease progression. And these light blue are very slow. Typical or slow is dark blue. And then rapid is going to be the green here. And the combined frequency of the patients with multiple neurological manifestations other than motor impairment are showed. And I discussed those. So this is a severity of neurological impairment that was related to disease duration. And there's you know, extra motor manifestations that were reported in these patients as well. Getting to the biomarkers of neurodegeneration in the CSF of HTLV1 infected individuals. Here you have the total tau protein and picograms per milliliter for asymptomatic ham TSB and control, as well as the NFL or the neurofilament light chain. And then you can see the, uh, the phosphorylated neurofilament heavy chain next to that. And then the prion, cellular prion protein and nanograms per milliliter there. So this was essentially quantified by an ELISA of the CSF in HTLV1 asymptomatic and ham or asymptomatic carriers and ham TSB patients. So there is a control group that were seronegative. And again, there were nine individuals that were included in that. So they performed a Crutes call Wallace test. And then since everything was good there, is it appropriate to do the Dunn's post test? for multiple comparisons. And then the statistical analysis uh, they performed were, was the Mann-Whitney test. And the p-value was greater than 0 0.05, which was considered significant. So this is identifying according to the speed of disease progression. Again, same thing. So the very slow is light blue in these diagrams, and the typical slow is dark blue, and the rapid is green. So individuals with the um, levels of total tau protein and NFL are according to the age correlated reference values. And those are shown in bold with these X circles. So you can see that here for the NFL and then asymptomatic carrier over here. And then the neo neopterin um, prevents an inflammasome activation in mammalian astrocytes. So here they did neuro neuropterin conditioning. And so you can see the, that the, neuropterin actually blocks inflammation. So looking at this biomarker and seeing how the patients are blocking inflammation uh, was the goal for this. And in this instance, it actually blocks IL-1 beta and then pro-IL-1 beta, um, and also the pro-caspase, which is activating the NLRP or the inflammasome with caspase one. So neuropterin actually prevents the inflammasome from activating in a million astrocytes which astrocytes, again, are found in the brain. So neopterin concentration in the serum and the CSF of the HTLV1-infected individuals are here. So here you have the serum, uh, the serum neopterin in nanomolars per liter, and you have the asymptomatic, the ham, TSB, and the control. And then the CSF is right next to that of the neopterin in nanomoles per liter. And you have, um, have p-values for those. Again, the the rate of the disease progression are shown in the different colors. And then you have the ratio of CSF, serum, neopterin shown in D here, as well as the ham TSP progression. And those P values are shown there. So the, the phosphorylated neurofilament heavy chain is the last diagram there, and that's in picograms per milliliter. Um, so these were, these were all quantified um, using uh, the, the serum neo CSF and serum neopterin. And they did, again, the Crucifer Wallace test and Dunn's test um, to see the correlation as well as the Spearman, Spearman correlation rank of the between uh, neopterin uh, CSF serum ratio and the ham TSB progression rate. And then the inflammatory cytokines in the serum of HTLV1 asymptomatic carriers and the ham TSB patients are shown. So here you have the CCL2 picograms per milliliter, CCR2, CCR3, CCR5, CXCR1, CXCR2, CCR4, CCR6, and CXCR3. And those are all, again, the asymptomatic, the ham TSB, and the control. So these chemokines were quantified by a multiplex cytometry B-based amino assay, and they were organized according to the recep uh, respective receptors that I that I just listed off. So the ham TSB patients were identified according to the speed of disease, and those are the colors that I've been discussing in all of these um, graphs. So they performed 
a comparison between two groups with the Man Whitney test. Um, and then they did the, they carried out the Kruzko Wallace test and subsequent Dunn's post test for multiple comparisons. So the difference in these p values, they're all shown here, um, were greater than 0 0.05, which were considered significant. And then in the CSF, the inflammatory cytokines of HTLV1 asymptomatic and HAM TSB patients. These were quantified using the same multiplex cytometry B based immunoassay. And those are the same uh, chemokine receptors CCL2, CCL11, CCL3, 4, 5, CXCL8, CXCL1, CXCL5, CCL17, CCL20, uh, CC, uh, CXCL9, CXCL10, and CXCL11. Um, and these were HAM TSP patients that were identified. Again, the speed of disease progression, very slow to typical slow and rapid are all shown in the different colors there. They performed the Mann-Whitney test and the analysis between three different groups and they were carried out with the Crutzville, Wallace, and Dunn's post-test. So the same methodology here. Again, p-value is 0 0.05 or greater, and that was considered significant. So the dashed lines um, in these graphs right here, sort of this threshold, is a graph of IP10, CXCL10 data that represents the upper and lower cutoffs for the CXCL10 concentration in the CSF to predict the speed of MTSB progression as very slow or typical slow and then rapid. And then getting to the neuroinflammatory activity of HTLV-1 asymptomatic and MTSB patients, you can see here the CSF serum ratio and all the different uh, CCLs and CXCLs and CXCRs of the chemokines and their receptors, as well as the cells in the CSF with CXCL10, as well as the different um, biomarkers of phosphorylated neurofilament heavy chain, and then the neopterin, as well as the neopterin CSF and serum ratio. So the ratio between the CSF and the serum of chemokines was calculated, and the values were greater than or equal to 0.1, which is what this dashed line shows here in A. And that's a positive gradient in the control of the migration of the immune cells to the uh, central nervous system. So the chemokines are shown in blue, or the chemokine receptors are shown in blue, and their respective ligands are shown above those. So in ham TSB patients, they're identified according to the speed, again, the speed of regression, and being light blue, dark blue, and green for increasing speed. The Spearman uh, correlation rank was used to evaluate the association between the CSF levels of CXCL10 and the CSF cell counts, as well, again, the phosphorylated neurofilament heavy chain and the CSF low levels of neopterin and neoterin CSF serum ratio. And the p-value was, again, above 0 0.05, which is considered significant. And then the expression of chemokine receptors by CT, CD4 T cells from HTLV1 infected individuals. So here we have uh, peripheral blood, uh, we have infected, which is tax positive, and uninfected, which is tax negative, CD4 positive T cells um, in the peripheral blood of asymptomatic carriers and HAM TSP patients that were identified by flow cytometry analysis after the intracellular staining of HTLV1 tax protein. And they did this in CD8 positive uh, T cell depleted PBMCs cultured for 20 hours without stimulation. So here you see the live dead cells and then the FS or forward scatter as well as a side scatter. And you can see the, mono, the live cells and the mononuclear cells. And then the live cells were gated and CD3 positive and CD4 positive T cells were select, selected for the subset of mononuclear cells. So you can see that CD4 and tax here in this final CD3 positive and CD4 positive flow cytometry analysis. The expression profile of the chemokine receptors CCR4, CCR5, and CXCR3, CXCR3 are evaluated here with different subsets of tax positive and tax negative. So here's tax negative, here's tax positive. You have the asymptomatic and the ham TSB. And all the different colors are CXCR3, CXCR4, CXCR5 positive and negative. So this was determined within the populations of tax positive and tax negative CD4 T cells. And then the comparison uh, between asymptomatic and ham TSP patients. And they performed a student uh, T test 
uh, which again, which is would be the null hypothesis. And that differences uh, with the p-value were again significant, uh, being above 0 0.05. So these ham TSP patients were identified according to the speed of progression. Uh, again, the different colors from light blue, dark blue to rapid, which is green. So you can see the CCR4 positive, C CD4 positive T cells um, correlated with the tax positive or tax negative and asymptomatic and ham carriers, as well as the CCR5, CD4 T cells, and the CXCR3, CD4 positive T cells. And then the rel relative expression of markers of neuroinflammation and neural, uh, neuronal, uh, neural, neuronal injury were shown. So here's the data of the CSF analysis of HTLV1 asymptomatic carriers and ham TSP patients identified by the very slow, which is the light blue, and then the dark blue, which is typical, and then the rapid, which is green. And there, there you can see the degrees per progression evaluated by this heat map analysis. So this included uh, the CSF cell counts. Um, you can see those here. And then the HTLV1 proviral load and the concentration of the neurofilament light chain and the phosphorylated heavy chain of the neurofilament, as well as the total tau protein and then the cellular prion protein, the neopterin and the inflammatory cytokine CCL2, 3, 4, 17, CXCL1, 5, 8, 10, and 11. So I'll go ahead and summar summarize the original research article. And it is that there's definitive neuro impairment in ham TSB. The biomarkers of neurogeneration in the CSF were shown in HTLV1 infected individuals. And those were tau, NFL, PNFH, PRPC, and neopterin. The inflammatory cytokines, or sorry, the inflammatory chemokines in the serum and the CSF in asymptomatic patients, as well as ham TSB patients were shown, as well as the neuroinflammatory activity of HTLV1 asymptomatic and ham TSB patients. And then the expression of chemokine receptors by CD4 positive T cells were shown in HTLV1 infected individuals, as well as the relative expression of markers of neuroinflammation and neuronal injury. So here you have the biomarkers, the serum, the CSF, and the neuroinfection. I want to thank you for your attention. And again, my virus was HTLV1 for seminar in cell and molecular biology. Thank you for your time.